The Night Bulletin presents Three Flash Fiction Tales, written and read by T.F. Ahmed. The Beast The Beast was waiting for the right time to strike. It was perched in a tree just outside the small cottage, observing the occupants through the windows. It noticed a teenage girl in a second-story window, undressing from her day clothes. It eyed this girl's slender frame, its mouth full of sharp teeth salivating at the prospect of clean, white flesh. It moved its gaze to the first-story window. A man and woman, both older than the girl above, sat on opposite sides of a table. The woman appeared to be weeping, her face in her hands. The beast cocked its head to the side, a surprisingly human gesture. The man was smiling, which was at odds with the expression of the woman across from him. The beast looked upstairs at the girl. She seemed to not notice or be party to the events below. The man pulled something from his waistband. It was dark gray and L-shaped. This object filled the beast with unease, a feeling it did not feel often. It knew what the object was, though it did not know the word for it. The man sat motionless, pointing the object at the woman. She seemed not to notice at first, but finally looked up. She recoiled in horror for an instant before the man clenched the object in his hand. There was a loud bang. At the same time, the woman flew backwards, and the girl upstairs started. The object had shot a projectile at high speed, puncturing the woman's skin and organs, causing a spray of blood to fly in all directions. The beast spread its wings and screamed into the night. Its meat was being spoiled, its pleasure ruined right before its eyes. It was hungry, and it did not eat things, already dead. It must eat the man before he harmed the girl upstairs. The beast, blacker than the night surrounding it, flew into the first floor of the cottage, shattering the window. It looked regretfully at the dead woman before observing the man run up the stairs. But before it could pursue its meal, it heard some horrid sounds. A scream truncated by gunfire, followed by another shot. It flew through the ceiling, crashing into the second story, It was greeted with a maddening sight. A girl lay sprawled on the floor, white gown awash with blood. The man sat leaning against the wall in the hallway, his exploded head turned at an odd angle. It had picked this cottage because it was isolated, because no one would hear its victim's screams. Everything was now ruined, and it was still hungry. In a final cry of despair, the beast crashed through the window and flew into the night, already searching for a new house of fresh meat. Melissa Melissa awoke and scratched the side of her head. He had cut her hair again during the night. Tears welled up in her eyes as thin strands of stray auburn hair danced in her vision and landed on her face. She wiped her eyes and sat up, scanning the small ten-foot-by-ten-foot room she occupied. He had cleaned it again. Her dolls were all in a neat row on a shelf opposite the pallet on which she slept. The ancient wooden floor was glossy and smelled of citrus. All the stray papers that had been left on the floor were now stacked neatly upon a small drawing desk. Melissa looked at the door that stood shut on the triangular wall next to her bed. It was small, but in her ten years on earth, Melissa hadn't grown much. She could walk through the door fully erect with ease. Papa had to crawl if he ever wanted to enter. The young girl crept from her bed careful to avoid the angled wall she slept under. She picked a doll at random from the shelf and proceeded to her little rocking chair. Cradling her dolls and rocking on this chair were Melissa's favorite activities. She talked to her dolls about the dreams she had and stared out the small circular window next to her chair. I dreamt about the other kids again, Melissa said to the doll lying in her lap. Her chair squeaked with every rocking. They all wore masks, and they were masks of my face. I told them to stop and show me their real faces, but they all just laughed. They wouldn't stop laughing, even when I told them to stop. I finally told them I'd tell Papa what they were doing and get them in trouble. But then they started screaming and running away in different directions. I told them to come back, that I was just kidding, 
But it was too late. They all left me alone. Melissa sighed and stopped stroking her doll. Rain fell down in sheets outside. The quiet, tree-lined street was devoid of life. I think I'll draw today, Melissa said to her doll, tossing it onto the rocking chair as she stood up. She had drawn yesterday, but she knew she wouldn't find those works of art on her table. Papa cleaned the drawings up every night while she was asleep. Sometimes he collected the good ones and told her she had done a good job. She had wanted to keep some ones, but Papa said keeping them was a bad idea. He said they would give her nightmares. Melissa listened to her Papa, but strangely, her nightmares persisted despite not having the drawings. Melissa approached her wooden drawing table. She sat in the old wooden stool and grabbed a sheet of paper. She grabbed a large piece of charcoal, twirling it in her fingers and letting the residue set into the ridges of her fingers. She tapped her upper lip, waiting for the drawing to come to her. The idea came a minute later, and she started scrawling on the page before her. She twirled her arm in broad strokes, flicked her tiny wrist back and forth for detail, and scrubbed shadows in with the pads of her fingers. She worked mechanically, only stopping for breath when the drawing was complete. She felt lightheaded. All she wanted to do was sleep. I did it again, she said, smiling. It was her finest work. She did several of these a day usually, but today this one would be enough to please Papa. He would be proud of her. On the page before her lay a detailed drawing, one of great precision and skill. A cruel, human face stared back at her, eyes black and shadowy, hairline high and peaked, cheeks shallow and sunken. The cords in the frail neck were just visible, falling off the chasm at the bottom of the page. The hair was thin and spindly, covering the ears and tickling the neck. She knew this was a bad man. All the pictures she drew were of bad men. They stared at her with mixed feelings of rage, surprise, and wonder. She placed the charcoal back into its box and reached for a pushpin. Standing on her stool, she pinned the drawing onto the wall with a prim sense of accomplishment. The gaunt face in the picture stared with a malevolent expression, like a prowler framed in a window. Melissa played with her dolls for the rest of the day, her fingers still stained with charcoal. The rain continued on and off, and in the rare pockets of time when it ceased, the gray remained. Hours later, Melissa heard the distant sound of a car outside. It ceased soon after, and she heard a door slamming. Papa was home. Melissa ceased her playing and listened. She heard the faint sound of the door opening and footsteps two floors below her. A thick set of keys clanged onto the counter, and a heavy sigh escaped a large man's lungs. She held her breath as heavy boots creaked up the stairs, slow from excess weight. The sound grew louder and more strained as the figure approached the stairs leading up to the attic. Papa is going to be so proud, she thought. The footsteps ceased, replaced with the sound of keys jangling together. Seconds later, the door opened with a distinct creak. The sound was unpleasant, but the girl's anticipation did not weaken. A large-bellied man crawled through the small door and knelt on one knee in front of Melissa. He wore dark brown slacks, a brown tucked-in shirt, and a pair of perpetually shiny shoes. A shiny metal star on his chest and a utility belt completed the uniform. Papa! she exclaimed, running into the large man's arms. He embraced her without ceremony and kissed her on the forehead. I have something for you, Papa, Melissa said. She tore the charcoal sketch from the wall and handed it to him. She watched his face as he studied the portrait, his eyebrows tight. Finally, his face evened and then turned sour. Melissa knew this look, but wasn't scared. She knew his scorn was not directed at her, but at the subject of the portrait. Papa looked at his daughter. He reached out and cupped her tiny chin. "'You've done well, Melissa,' he said in a smooth, gentle voice. "'You've done very well indeed.' He turned and started backing into the small doorway. "'You may play with your dolls for the rest of the night if you'd like.' Melissa tried to ask a question, but the door slammed before she could even utter the first word. As she heard the lock slide into place, she pondered how it would have gone had she voiced her inquiry. "'Papa, can you please stop cutting my hair?' "'No, child. I must cut your hair every few months. It keeps your vision clear.' "'Then must I be locked up in here like an animal in a zoo, Papa?' 
The world outside is dangerous, child. You already know this from the work you make for me. I know, Papa. I just thought I would ask. She held back tears again for her beautiful hair and took a deep breath. Papa said she should play, so she would play. The sheriff walked down the stairs from his attic, clutching the sketch his daughter had made. He had been looking for the South Bank Strangler for months. They had few witnesses and little physical evidence, but they did have a suspect. What he held now proved their suspicions. He could now grab the man and end his reign of terror. Melissa did not know she had drawn the South Bank Strangler. She never knew who she drew, only that they were all bad people. Knowing wasn't a part of her ability. Only drawing their faces was. He had discovered her ability by accident. She was doodling at the breakfast nook and happened to draw the perfect likeness of a man they had in custody on suspicion of robbery. He hadn't been on the news and wasn't from the neighborhood. The chance of her seeing him was impossible. Honey, what is it that you're drawing there? He had asked. A bad man, Melissa said without looking up. What did the bad man do? I don't know, Melissa said, embarrassment touching her voice. I just know he's a bad man. A very bad man. The sheriff hadn't thought the suspect was guilty of anything, but his daughter's sketch caused him to look further. He soon discovered a hole in the young man's story. He was able to extract a confession out of him which led to a conviction and a lengthy prison sentence. He had asked Melissa to draw again. And again. And again. Every time she drew a face, he matched it with a real person and dug into their past. They were always guilty of something, be it fraud or robbery or murder. It didn't matter how long the case had been cold or how hot and fresh it was. Melissa always drew the bad men. He hadn't wanted to put her in the attic, in that cage, but there was no other way to protect her. He would upgrade Melissa's room to something more livable soon. He simply couldn't afford it yet. He looked at the sketch in his hand. It was okay that she had only drawn this one man today instead of the usual ten or twelve. She deserved to be rewarded. Maybe he would finally buy Melissa some real toys to play with. Sealed The day started out normal enough. I woke up, made coffee, and had a simple breakfast. I set my laptop on the kitchen counter, pulled my stool close, and began to type. I was working on the third chapter of my first novel, and I was on a roll. I had been distracted lately, and I was determined to get as many words on the page as possible. I live in a basement apartment. I have windows, but they rarely allow in any sunlight. There was one window in the kitchen, one on the opposite wall in the living room, one in the bathroom, and one in my bedroom. I kept the blinds drawn in the living room and kitchen for privacy. Because of this, I did not notice the change in light throughout the morning. I was focused on typing, focused on bringing my novel to life. After a few hours, the coffee caught up with me. I saved my work and headed to the bathroom. I stood over my toilet and let loose, whistling the tune from Suspiria. My head lulled from side to side as I whistled, but I abruptly stopped when I noticed the bare wall in front of me. The bare wall that usually had a square window of frosted glass. I reached out and touched the wall. It felt smooth and real, and there was no seam where the window had been. It was as if there had never been a window at all. I didn't bother washing my hands. I bolted out of the bathroom and went to my kitchen. The window appeared to still be there. I raised the blinds and was met with a horrible sight. A blank wall, the same color as the surrounding drywall. I turned towards my living room window, the bile rising in my throat as I reached for the blinds. Another blank wall. My bedroom window was similarly missing. At this point, I was terrified, adrenaline pumping through my body. I ran to the front door and let out a disbelieving laugh. There was no door. Instead, I was greeted by another blank wall. I started hyperventilating. My apartment had never felt so dark. The air suddenly felt precious, like every breath was bringing me closer to my demise. I reached for my cell phone. No signal. I opened the web browser on my laptop. No internet access. Of course. I was trapped. I sat in my stool, put my face in my hands, and tried to wrap my head around this ridiculous scenario. 
but then I looked at my laptop and saw the blinking cursor next to the paragraph I had just finished typing. I smiled and straightened up in my seat. I would definitely reach my writing goal today. That was The Beast, Melissa, and Sealed. Please rate, review, subscribe, and tell a friend about this podcast. Thank you for listening, happy Halloween, and we'll see you next time on The Night Bulletin.